The views and opinions of the guests of Veterans Archives do not reflect the views and opinions of Veterans Archives, its subsidiaries, or its partners. Hello and welcome to Veterans Archives. This is a podcast where you can learn about our military history in the words and voices of the men and women who lived and created it. I'm your host, Bill Krieger, and let's listen to our next story. All right, today is Thursday, July 12th, 2023, and I am talking with George Valoris, who served in the United States Army. Uh, so George, we're going to start out real simple. If you could just tell us where and when you were born. I was born uh, in Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, on July the 5th, 1936, uh, at St. Vincent's Hospital. My uh, mother and father were immigrants from Greece. My father had a flower shop in Indianapolis. Um, and uh, I have a younger sister who's four years younger than me. Uh, four, uh, her name is Cecilia uh, Dana Gellis now. She's married. Um, we lived uh, downtown Indianapolis for uh, until I was about uh, four years old. And then we moved to uh, a rented home on Delaware Street in Indianapolis. Uh, on the near north side. Uh, I attended Robert's kindergarten uh, and then uh, went to, uh, started grade school at public school number 45 in Indianapolis. Uh, we stayed, we lived in that house until I was in the sixth grade, uh, at which time my father uh, bought a home on Fall Creek Parkway in Indianapolis. Um, and that was the first home that we owned, actually. And um, <clears throat> I then uh, transferred from public school number 45 to public school number 66 uh, and finished my grade school at that location. Um, I attended Shortridge High School. And uh, while at Shortridge, uh, was uh, in the National Honor Society, was on the math team, uh, was on the... Uh, track team and the cross country team. We were city champions in track, uh, state champions in cross country in my senior year. Um, and, um, uh, was, uh, active socially. I, I loved it. It was a great high school. Anyway, uh, upon graduation. So, I had, so before we go too much further though, I do want to kind of go back a little bit. Um, you you say your parents were from Greece. Yes. So, um, let's talk about your parents just for a few minutes. Okay. So what was your mother's name? Uh, my mother's name was uh, Aliki Alice. Uh, her maiden name was Kotsarelis. Um My father came to America in 1912 uh, when he was 12 years old and lived in New York City with a bunch of other immigrant men. Uh, he sold uh, flowers from a push cart and, and newspapers uh, and went to school. Uh, learned English, uh, and uh, came to Indianapolis in the, the late 1920s uh, and opened a small flower shop at that time. In 1935, he went back to Greece on a holiday, a visit, <clears throat> I think principally to get married. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> he was uh, met my mother uh, in, the villa, in the town of Agrinion, and uh, he was fixed up with my mother by my new uncle, uh, Nick Valoris, who had a jewelry store in Agrinion. Uh, my mother and dad uh, were married in Agrinion, Greece, in 35, and uh, traveled back to the States. Uh, and um, soon after, I was born. Well, so let me ask you this. When you think about your parents, we'll start with your mom, and then we'll, we'll talk about your dad. But do you have maybe like a favorite memory of your mom? Like when you think about your mom, this is what you think about. Uh, my mom, my mom was a uh, was a very uh, good cook and uh, very uh, creative, uh, and and just really took great care of all of us at home. Uh, she was also very religious and made sure that. Uh, I did. We we did our thing with uh, Sunday school, and I was an altar boy at the Greek church uh, in Indianapolis. 
uh, and then later as an adult, as a, as a young adult, uh, sang in the choir. Uh, but mom was uh, very uh, hands on, and uh, uh, just was a great lady. She was a very pretty woman, um, and um, it it was she was she was great. That's nice. So, what about your dad? What do you remember about him? Mostly? Well, my dad was a, was a pistol. He uh, <laughs> he was uh, not. He was only about five foot six, five seven. Uh, he was a, a very uh, uh, active. He uh, belonged to the YMCA. He was a noon league handball champion in the at the YMCA. Uh, he was uh, very social. Everybody knew him. Uh, uh, he knew everybody in, in the downtown area in Indianapolis. Um, he was a great salesman in the sense of, of the, in his flower shop and had a lot of really loyal customers. Uh, we called him, his nickname was the Colonel because he was, he was in charge. So, <laughs> okay. so we called him, the Colonel was in charge and, and he was, uh, uh, he was really funny. He, he read a lot. He was very interested in politics and uh, he would read, and he would he would get newspapers and magazines and underline important things that he thought were things that he thought were important, and and would make sure that I got, got that I saw those and, and read them. Uh, and uh, he was he was great. He was just a really wonderful guy and a great pal. He was uh, he was really good. Great, and I don't want this to get lost for anybody that's listening to this. So your dad comes from Greece, ends up in New York with a flower cart. Uh, but now he owns a flower shop yeah. in Indianapolis. A small so flower shop, yeah. Right. But still, I mean, yeah. if you think about the American dream, yeah, exactly. that's it's really precisely. where it starts, it, right? It is exactly. That is precisely it. And uh, uh, it was always amazing to me in later life, and I thought reflected on it, is how they never made very much money uh, in their business. My father and, and, and a lot of his colleagues who had other businesses, uh, you know, dry cleaners, shoe shine stands, mm-hmm. uh, restaurants, bars, they never made a lot of money, but they had everything. They, some, they, and, and they, they were very honest, uh, citizens, um, paid their taxes, did, you know, supported their church, but it, it was just amazing how they were able to, to, to manage, uh, their lives so effectively. It was, it, it was really interesting and, and, and impressive, I have to say. Oh, yeah. So what, now what about your sister? So, so it was just you and your sister mm-hmm. Cecilia was her name? Cecilia. Okay. Cecilia went to the same high school I did. She was four years behind me. And upon graduation, went to DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana, and uh, f- finished there with a degree in, uh, and was a teacher. And she came back to Indianapolis and taught... Uh, at uh, one of the high schools in Indianapolis. And then uh, a few years later, uh, married uh, Dr. Jim Danigellis, who was a radiologist from Burlington, Vermont, also a Greek, a boy of Greek origin. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> they moved out east as he was practicing in uh, Syracuse, New York. Um, so uh, that was our family. Okay. All right. I, I have to ask, though. Was the sister's marriage an arranged marriage, like with your father? Or was no, this... no, not not really. Okay. Not really arranged, no. Okay. Because I noticed, you know, being yeah. in a Greek family, not being Greek myself, I noticed a lot of Greek people marry Greek yeah. people, yeah. so I was just curious. Well, it's encouraged. Yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I know that. that. <laughs> I'm glad that Dan seemed to like me. <laughs> yeah, it's encouraged, yes. Yeah. Otherwise, it would have been a problem. It so. would have been a big problem, yeah. So good. So when we left off, you were um, you were in high school. You were yeah. getting ready to graduate. <clears throat> yeah. Did you? So I, I noticed very academically you were there. Um, did you play any sports in high school? I did. I ran track, uh, ran the mile. Um and ran the mile relay, and ran. We were city champions in track, and we were state champions in cross country, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh, lettered in both sports. Um, and uh, was involved socially. Was in key club, was a national honor society, um, and uh, did pretty well academically. I wasn't first in my class, but I was at the top ten percent, so five mm-hmm. percent, I guess, maybe. I don't know. So, so what happens? What happens after high school? Uh, <clears throat> I had uh, received a scholarship to go to Purdue. I'd always wanted to be an engineer, mm-hmm. and uh, I had received a scholarship to Purdue University, and I also had a scholarship to Cornell in Ithaca, New York. Uh, my parents 
were not too keen about me going that far away. Mm -hmm. uh, Purdue was far enough as far as they were concerned. <laughs> so, and it was uh, a, a cheaper. The, the, the Cornell scholarship was was an, was an honor, and it was had some money with it, but not a lot of money. So it was not it, it was not uh, terribly advantageous to take that up. So right. I attended Purdue <clears throat> as a as an engineering student, as a freshman engineer. Um, uh, was on the track team at Purdue, uh, ran a mile. I was not not even close to being the number one miler, uh, but did okay and ran in different events over the over the four year period. Mm -hmm. uh, pledged uh, Sigma Chi fraternity uh, and uh, loved it. Uh, made a lot of lifelong friends. Uh, from uh, from the from my pledge class and from the fraternity, um, <clears throat> in my junior year, uh, I had a scholarship to go to Switzerland for a semester, and um, uh, at the Technische Hochschule in Zurich, Switzerland. So, which uh, conveniently, all their all their classwork is done in English, even though it's in Switzerland. Well, that's convenient. Uh, that's really convenient. <laughs> so, and it, it is one of the top three engineering schools in Europe, and maybe in the top ten in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I was sponsored by Alu Swiss, which is a Swiss aluminum company. Uh, and I did some, I was also a, a, what they called a Werkstudent, a working student. So I, I went to the smelter in Chippe in the Canton Valley in Switzerland for uh, uh, so, some weeks and worked in their electrical engineering department. They, did, they generated hydroelectric, uh, okay. electricity uh, using hydropower. Uh, from the, they were up in the Alps, so mm -hmm. the, they had a lot of glacier melt, whatever. So that was really exciting and an awful lot of fun. Uh, what that that thing did to me, though, is it caused me uh, to not go to ROTC summer camp because at Purdue, being a land grant college in that era, uh, man, ROTC for two years, the first two years was mandatory. Really? Yes. I did not know that. Yes. All okay. land grant colleges. Michigan State was the same way, actually. Oh, all right. <clears throat> all land grant colleges were, were that way. So ROTC was mandatory for two years. Mm -hmm. uh, the second two years were optional, upon which at graduation you would be, receive a commission. Right. Um, but I missed my summer camp because I was in Switzerland, mm -hmm. so I had to go after graduate, after so I didn't graduate in 1958 like I was supposed to. I graduated in January of 59 because I had to go to, I had to take a couple of extra classes to make up for what I had missed being in Switzerland. So these were, so the, I, I, I didn't, I this is, I'm trying to wrap my head around this. So ROTC was built right into your class schedule. So if oh, yes. Oh, yes. If you didn't meet your ROTC commitments, you didn't graduate. Uh, no, if you didn't meet your ROTC commitments, you'd get drafted. <laughs> oh, well, there's that, right? There's yes, that. Because okay. the, the draft was alive and well in, oh, the, in that okay. era. So, I got you now. I so in fact, I had several fraternity brothers who, who decided they were not interested in studying anymore because they, the, the school sent your grades to your draft board. Oh. <clears throat> and if you didn't make your grades... Stay act, you know, and yeah. you got a phone call to show up for for, for a physical. It's a whole different so, world back so, then. Oh yes, yeah. oh yes. <laughs> and I had a couple of fraternity brothers who decided to major in bridge and other card games, and then they they got the call, and oh. uh, they ended up getting drafted. As, so, oh my goodness. Okay. So, uh, All right. <clears throat> anyway, um, I opted for advanced ROTC and and was commissioned. Uh, and, and was commissioned in the Signal Corps mm -hmm. uh, because the electrical elect, and because I, I graduated as an electrical engineer. Electrical engineers went typically were assigned to Signal Corps. Mechanical engineers were typically assigned to Ordnance. Uh, chemical engineers were assigned to the Chemical Corps, so they they tried to slot you to your uh, academic background. Right. Um, so I graduated in uh, in the January of fifty nine, and I did receive my orders to report for act to active duty in May of fifty nine. In the meantime, I uh, work was working as a staff engineer at the Naval Avionics Facility in Indianapolis, uh, working on a on a Navy on a weapon system for the A three D bomber as a one of the engineers, mm -hmm. uh, and and did that. <clears throat> um, I went to, on May 9th, 1959, um, 
I reported to a duty at uh, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, to attend the signal officer's basic course. Uh, I, I neglected to mention that I did go to summer camp at Fort Gordon, Georgia, the summer before, uh, which was uh, ROTC summer camp for Signal Corps. Okay, people from that because there were kids from colleges all over the country in that in that group. Summertime and, uh, in Fort Gordon that doesn't sound like a great. Uh, it was time. not much fun. No, I'll bet. <laughs> not much fun at all. No, I'll bet. <laughs> it, it was the pits actually. <laughs> yeah, and the <clears throat> the drill sergeants were all Southern boys. Uh, and and they didn't like northern boys, so they, <laughs> they, they made it even better. Oh, they, oh yeah, it was interesting. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, I reported to Fort Monmouth and uh, went to signal officer school, which was I think uh, six or eight weeks, something like that. Um, and uh, w- while at school, near the end of the program, uh, one of my f- good friends, Bill Stringer from the University of Iowa. Uh, and I were uh, at a happy hour at the club, and and uh, he said, you know, we should go to jump school. And I said, are you kidding me? And I said, I'd be, my, you know, my mother would kill me if she thought it'd be, you know. <laughs> right. And and besides that, I'm scared to death of doing something like that. So he, after a few more drinks, we decided that if neither one of us did that, we were chickens. So we signed up to go to jump school. <laughs> so. Some right. of the best decisions in the military are made just that way. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, I then rep- I was in. Uh, I did receive my orders, and I went to uh, f- uh, Fort uh, Benning, and um, uh, the five hundred third PIR Parachute Infantry Regiment was. They were the guys who taught us uh, and uh, and and managed us and and harassed us <laughs> through jump school. <laughs> yep. So I got my jump wings and. I stayed on for another three weeks because they had a special course at Benning for non-infantry officers, young officers, field grade, company grade officers, uh, teaching uh, us about defensive tactics because we had, like in the Signal Corps, you had remote radio relay sites and things that had to be defended. So right. they taught us how to manage those kinds of things. So it was kind of interesting. And and as a result of that, I got an expert infantry badge because we learned how to use all these different infantry weapons. None of which, by the way, we had in our TONE. We did. We, we, right. We, we had fifty caliber guns and, <laughs> and pistols and carbines, and that was it. So I had recoilless rifles and mortars and all that other stuff. All so, the good stuff. All really. good stuff. Yeah. All but we didn't have any of that. We all the desirable used, things. We didn't use any of that stuff. Um, upon completion, I was assigned. I received orders to go to Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Mm-hmm. which was the home of the Army Electronic Proving Ground. And I was assigned to the um, first to the 56th Signal Company, which was a signal maintenance uh, company. Uh, and uh, very shortly thereafter, I was transferred to the 232nd Signal Company support uh, there. And uh, then... Uh, Department of Defense apparently decided to disperse some some units, and they moved B Company of the 50th Airborne Signal Battalion out of 18th Corps, 18th Airborne Corps, mm-hmm. out of Fort Bragg, and they moved B Company to Fort Huachuca, and they moved uh, A Head and A stayed at Fort Bragg, and uh, Charlie went to Fort Riley, Kansas. Anyway, because I was jump qualified and they did not have enough uh, jump qualified officers to bring out there. They transferred me once again from the 232nd, which like I walked across the street. Uh-huh. And I was now in B Company of the 50th as a platoon leader and then later on as an executive officer. And um, uh, um, at the end of my tour, uh, I was acting company commander because they didn't have enough captains at that moment. And I just happened to be the ranking first lieutenant mm-hmm. of data rank. Um, so at a very a lot of fun uh, at Fort Huachuca. We we were there for two reasons. We did two things while we were there. Principally, uh, we were supported uh, projects in the at the electronic proving ground for new uh, and sophisticated signal equipment, and we also were assigned to support uh, for Sixth Army. Uh, this, the maneuver uh, for maneuvers <clears throat> and exercises, we would we would support the managers, the, the umpires, referees, and managers of of uh, of these maneuvers. 
we didn't we were not part of the maneuver we were there supporting okay so uh and so we were all over the place we were uh at fort irwin out in the desert training center of fort irwin california uh three times we were at yakima firing center in washington uh, twice um we were in Grafenwehr, Germany. We were returned forces to Germany. We flew to Germany <laughs> and came back. Wow. Um, so uh, we were busy, and, and, and it was a lot of fun. It was, like I've always said, the Army was great as long as they're not shooting at you. So, <laughs> right, right. It doesn't sound like a whole lot of that was happening, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so it was, it was a hell of a lot of fun. So <clears throat> um, I uh, near the in uh, um, March... Of uh, 61, I believe it was. Uh, we received orders to uh, move to to go to San Diego. We were placed on alert to mm-hmm. go to San Diego. And so we moved all our equipment. We convoyed over across, not too far, across southern Arizona uh, through uh, Tucson to Yuma and then into San Diego. And went. To, we were loaded on a, on a troop ship, uh, not knowing why or where we were going, but just be there. Right. So, uh, <laughs> well, uh, let me ask you a question. Like a convoy like that's, that's, that's a lot of moving parts. Is there anything that happened on that convoy? That, it, yes. That yes. Sticks out in your mind. It, something very interesting. So, uh, we were, uh, we had, uh, um, uh, 170 men in the mm-hmm. company and we had about, uh, uh, 55 to 60 vehicles, something in that, that range. We had yeah. anywhere from Jeeps to a uh, deuce and a half with huts and, you know, radio equipment and radio relay equipment and cryptographic equipment and what have you. Uh, two things happened on that, on that particular trip. Uh, I had a, a government credit card to buy gas. And of course we needed gas because these trucks we're not particularly fuel efficient. Right. So we're near Yuma, Arizona, and we pulled into this great, huge truck stop uh, because it was time for the guys to have breakfast, and we needed to buy like 5,000 gallons of gas. Yeah. So um, I'm in the lead Jeep, and my driver, uh, Private Hayes, uh, was black. <clears throat> So we pull in, and I said, uh, the guy, the manager comes running out, and he sees all the trucks, and he's, he's salivating because he can see. It's so, so a pretty good sale. Yes. Come yeah, up, yeah. right? And just be sure you don't order buy uh, high-test gas, because the government won't, re- will, you'll pay the difference if, if, you, if you screw that <laughs> yeah, up. Right. So uh, he, I said, my guys are all inter- want to have breakfast, and we need to buy, you know, five or 6,000 gallons of gas. I'm not sure what. He says, well, he can't eat here. Talk about your driver. My driver. We're yeah. in uniform and we're armed. I got sidearms, and you know. Yeah, I soldiers. Said, I said, I beg your pardon. He says he can't eat here. Those guys can't. Those guys can't eat here. And he used the the N word. Mm-hmm. And I said, he's a United States serviceman in uniform, and you're telling me he can't eat here. He says that's right. I said, well, then we're not going to eat here. We're leaving. So mount up, and we left. The guy was beside himself. Oh, I'll bet. But I said, no way are, no way are we going to do this. Right. We get to the California border, <clears throat> and um, there they had, at that time, they may still have this, they had agricultural check stations. Mm-hmm. So they would stop all vehicles and check for fruits and fruit flies and all kinds of goofy stuff. So this inspector comes up and he says, we need to look in these huts, you know, that the, the were on the back of the deuce naps. Right. And I said, you can't, because most of them had, had cryptographic equipment in them. They were, you know, classified. Right. So I said, I, I don't think you're cleared for that. And I said, so you can't do that. He says, well, you can't go. I said, well, listen. I said, you better talk to your supervisor because we're not going to unlock these vans for you to prowl around in them. Because <laughs> I said, number one, number two, we don't have any fruit and vegetables. We're, we're on a military mission right now. Yeah, exactly. So, so after a lot of hooping and hollering, they let us go. We get to San Diego, get on the ship. The rest of the battalion now has is arriving mm-hmm. from uh, Bragg and, and Riley and uh, what have you. And uh, the battalion commander, Colonel Kern Camp, uh, assembles all the officers, and he says, gentlemen, he says, uh, we are going to Laos. And I'm 
and now this is in March. I'm supposed to get out in May. Right. After my, for my two year uh, mm-hmm. thing. I raised my hand and I said, sir, I said, um, I'm supposed, I said, I have two questions. I said, number one, where is Laos? And number two, I'm supposed <laughs> to get out on the 9th of May. He says, well, here's where Laos is. And he said, you're not getting out on the 9th of May. <laughs> You've been extended. <laughs> You've been extended. Yeah. Uh, I, I, sir. Yeah. So, so I was extended. Uh, anyway, we were supposed to go to per, to provide a communications, a big network of communications for uh, what we didn't know was there were 5,000 U.S. Army trainers and special forces people mo- roaming the mountains of Laos, Cambodia, and, and Vietnam, mm-hmm. uh, training the Montagnards. So this is before This is before the Vietnam. This Vietnam is 61, yeah. yeah. The war had not... And nobody was talking about it. Nobody knew this. This was right. really secret stuff. Yeah. So, but they scrubbed our mission. Uh, we never never went. I still got extended. For, 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 <laughs> they didn't for, change that. <laughs> for, no, for, no I, I still got extended for six months. Um, but uh, years later, I, re- I met a couple of fellows who were in 5th Special Forces who were over there, and they said, we're glad you didn't come because... We didn't want Washington interfering <laughs> with our with our work, <laughs> so I thought, well, mission accomplished. Yeah, you know, it worked. So. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> um, that that uh, ended my military, in my active duty career. So, came back to Indianapolis, uh, was assigned to a reserve unit, the 70th Infantry uh, Regiment. And would go to the meetings. There were like 300 second lieutenants there. It was really kind of a goofy thing. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And had uh, went, had to go to two summer camps. Um, and I'll jump ahead a little bit. The first summer camp was uh, at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. I had to, I went. I flew down. They flew me down there in a commercial. And uh, I taught communications to young men for mm-hmm. two weeks and spent a lot of time at the club in the pool. The second uh, summer camp I went to, I was just attached to the 38th Infantry Division, the Indiana National Guard, and I was responsible for, uh, uh, because I had an EIB, uh, they they had put me in charge of the 4.2-inch the mortar range. Oh, okay. So um, um, I... Uh, uh, went to the range, was at the range at at, up, uh, at Camp Grayling, Northern Michigan, mm-hmm. and uh, the the deuce and a halfs with the guardsmen pulled up, with the, uh, led by a jeep with a, a major uh, in it, and uh, salute, you know, welcome to the range. And there was a there was also was a, a range uh, noncom there. Uh, who was a full-time uh, employee, basic or assignment at that grayling? He was kind of the, took care of the range. Mm-hmm. I was responsible for the range. Uh, as we're talking, the, the men are un- unloading this big Coke cooler off the back of this deuce and a half. Um, I didn't think too much of it until I walked over there and I looked in. It was full of beer. No. Oh. And so I said, Major, I said, this is a live fire range with hot projectiles. <laughs> right. And I said, we are not drinking beer at my range. That's all. Yeah, we can't do that. He said, we've always done this. I said, well, not today. <laughs> so he he chewed me out. He said, I'm going to report you. I said, that's fine, sir. Do it. But I said, the range is closed. Mm-hmm. So I shut the range down. They left, took their cooler with them. <laughs> I don't know where they went. <laughs> anyway, and then but then they tried to recruit me to join the guard because they wanted uh, airborne qualified people, and, and uh, I said, no way, no way, right. no way. Anyway, so that pretty much ended my military uh, time, because and I got deferred from attending any more reserve meetings because I was working. Uh, again, back at the Naval Avionics facility on on some military stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, well, let me ask you this: so yeah. you're, that's kind of the end of your your military career, my so army speak, career, your yeah. army career, right? So, you know, looking back on that, is there like one or two lessons that you took away from that as you as you left that you carried on with you? Well, of course, you you learn a lot about leadership. 
the hard way, sometimes the hard way, uh, when you have a bunch of young men um, who uh, who from different such you know so many different walks of life uh, that that require uh, you know careful management and uh, mm-hmm. you know and and training and coaching mentoring uh, and um, responsibility you know there you know we I, I was responsible for millions of dollars worth of equipment you know and a bunch of men and their safety and health uh, it was a I don't want to say sobering it was it was a very maturing if I'm using the right term, yeah. uh, experience for me. <clears throat> and it helped shape my uh, future perspective on, on management and and, um, um, uh, and all of the uh, pros and cons of, of management styles and, and, that, and what have you. And you were, I mean, if you think about it, you were pretty young yeah, to have all that responsibility. Yeah, 20, yeah 21 years, 21, 22 years old, you know. Yeah. Well, your peers are out doing probably other things. Um, well, all of the all of my fraternity brothers, all my pledge brothers, ended up in the military. We are all, we're all in the military. Almost everybody, oh, okay. uh, every, almost everybody was commissioned in either the army, the air force, the marines, or the navy. Uh-huh. So they, they, we all had that you know that uh, some form of experience like that. Okay. Uh, and and they, and we've talked about it is because we still communicate. Those of us that are still alive. Uh-huh. Um, and, uh, and we had a lot of guys, the guys had a lot of very, very interesting experiences, uh, and all over the world. And, um, it, it was, it was, uh, interesting. Um, I remember just as a, as an aside, one of my pledge brothers, John Sand was a Navy, uh, ensign and then the JG. And he was on a, he was an engineering officer on an LST mm-hmm. based out of uh, San Diego or out of, uh, I said Long Beach, excuse me. And when we were on maneuvers at Fort Irwin over a weekend, we we were off because the maneuver hadn't started yet. So he invited me over and to have lunch with him on his LST. Mm-hmm. And I went over there, and I was just it was amazing uh, because uh, we were served. You know, Filipino steward served us with a tablecloth and all his silverware and all that. I'd been eating Z rations for two weeks, <laughs> and I thought, "Wow, this is cool." So it was a lot of fun. Your experience as an officer was probably much different than his. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes. Oh yes. Uh, <clears throat> another thing that happened, uh, if I, if I can backtrack a little bit, absolutely. This is your story. Um, we were. It was. I think it was exercise Mesquite Dunes. It was a big. Armor exercise at Fort out at Fort Irwin, and and they had the uh, uh, 40th Armored Division and and a, and a couple of reconnaissance squadrons from one from the First Infantry Division and one from someplace else. I don't remember exactly. And the air it was an, also a joint exercise. The Air Force was doing uh, 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 strafing, mock strafing, and, yeah. and and bombing, and so. <clears throat> They the Air Force sent a a forward air controller over a young a young pilot, sec, a lieutenant for a first lieutenant maybe. Um, they brought him over in a helicopter and he, they they gave him to me to us because we had the air to ground radio the ARC twenty seven uh, radio for for which he could communicate with his uh, aircraft. Oh, okay. So he shows up at, to spend about a week with us in a flight suit and uh, boots. And that's it. And of course, the desert at night gets very, very cold. The temperature change is dr- dramatic, and it's you got to have the right kind of clothing. And, and he, he, he didn't have a sleeping bag; he had nothing except his flight suit and his ID, his dog tags, Air Force. <laughs> so we we fixed him up with with the right clothing, and we we gave him a sleeping bag, and I let him sleep in my hooch because I had a, a little hooch on my trailer, mm-hmm. on one of the trailers so that I had a bunk in and, and a map board and all that. So I, he was beholden to us big time. So he says, well, when this is over, he said, I want you to come over to George Air Force Base, which is in Victorville, California, not very far away. And he said, I'm going to take you for a ride. So I said, wow, I'd love to do that. Oh, yeah. So uh, I did that after the maneuver exercise was over. And he took me for a ride in an RF-101 Voodoo uh, jet fighter, two-seater, 
across the desert at treetop level. It scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> It, it, it was pretty amazing. fast, don't it, they? Oh my God! It, well, I don't know. We were going pretty good. Anyway, it, it was amazing. It was uh, it was really a, a heart stopping experience, <laughs> I have to say. So, anyway, uh, that pretty much ends the uh, military side of my of my life. And um, so, when you got out from active duty, you said you were still working at the Navy Electronics. Yes, I was working at the Naval Avionics Facility in Indianapolis, which is a very large. Development facility for a, a naval aviation uh, r- radar, uh, uh, bomb dire- bomb directing systems, and what have you. Um, and I was working a- again on this a- this ASB seven uh, weapon system for the A three D bomber uh, because we had some really exotic. Uh, test equipment like vacuum chambers and and vibration equipment and and what have you uh we got a we got a, a very unique project the, the 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 facility was assigned a very unique project uh they called it project 435 and what it was was the uh, building testing and launching of the first navigation satellites it was called the transit navigation satellite mm-hmm and it was designed uh, and conceived by the Applied Physics Laboratory of Johns Hopkins University, and they had launched a couple of prototypes, but now they needed a, a kind of a, a production uh, facility to to do the to continue. Uh, the satellite was designed to support the fleet ballistic missile program, the Polaris program, uh-huh. and because submarines. Uh, that had ballistic missiles on board. All of these, all of these missiles were pre-programmed. They had targets pre-programmed. Yeah, these were fire and forget. Right? Yes, yes. Yeah. And the only thing that the missile needed was, in, in addition to somebody pushing the button or turning the key, they had to know where they were at the time of launch because mm-hmm. they knew where they were going to go. They just didn't had to know where they were starting from. So they needed an, a precise navigation fix. And the only way you could do that before the satellite was to surface and use a sextant in the classic way, mm-hmm. surface and pick up a Loran C, which was a transmitter. These were they had transmitters around the world that, that had shot had radio beams that you could pick up and do, and do a triangulation. Uh, and the submariners did not like the idea of surfacing because that was not a good thing for them. Right. It exposes them, right? It's, absolutely. Yeah. And so the satellite was was a, a key, a really critical thing for them. So uh, the management at the facility uh, pulled together a group of, y- of young engineers. I, I was lucky to be one of them. Uh, to work on this project, there were about ten or ten or eleven of us, <clears throat> and um, so we started working on it. We went to Johns Hopkins. We learned a lot about it, and we started assembling the stuff. And uh, I ended up—I was ended up—I started as the uh, command system engineer. I had the system for the receivers to command that commanded the satellite in space, and then I got promoted. Uh, later on, I ended up being the, the head of the group, the, the chief of the satellite systems engineering branch. Okay. So I had the, the whole project, and I was responsible for for not only building it, but getting it delivered to either Vandenberg Air Force Base or 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 uh, uh, Cape Canaveral uh, and launching it. Let's take a quick break. Veterans Archives is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we rely on donations from our listeners. If you are enjoying these stories and would like to support our continued efforts, please go to www.veteransarchives.org and select the donate button. Thank you. Huge responsibility. It, it was. It it's was, still pretty yeah. young, right? Yeah, I was that in my twenties. Yeah, I was yeah. 20, 26, 27 years old. Um, and um, uh, so we, you know, we built satellites. Several. We built, you know, like six or seven. Uh, launched. Took them out and launched the 
Uh, we launched them on uh, Scout uh, launch vehicles, uh, uh, Thor, Able Star, Atlas, Agena, depending on, on what else, because they were, usually had multiple payloads. Mm -hmm. But that was a very interesting uh, experience. It was exciting. Um, uh, it, it just, I mean, it was just really thrilling, actually. Uh, well, you're really part of history that changed the world well, because that that really changed how we did things once they were able to launch. Well, the that's right, and they, I mean, the the launches. Some of them were successful, some of them were not. Right. Uh, we had one. Uh, the range officer at Vandenberg blew up the whole thing because it, the, the 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 launch vehicle was veering off course, and of course, for safety purposes, they had to they had to blow it up. Uh, we had one satellite. Uh, Going downrange, the third stage did not uh, was tumbling, uh, and rather than being going downrange, and when it when it ignited, it, it was actually pointed down at the ocean, and it it actually just drove the satellite into the deep. So oh, no, <laughs> so, the whole the satellite, the, the third and fourth stage, and all the, all this stuff with it. So we lost, you know, we we lost a few, <clears throat> but the space programs were were. Pretty new then. I mean, they were you know they were uh, in their infancy, right? And um, anyway, we finished the pro. We did the program for a few years, and um, uh, at the end of the the first phase, <coughs> uh, the the uh, SP twenty three that the Bureau of Weapons that was a, a special projects that was responsible for the Polaris system awarded the contract for the follow-on follow manufacture of satellites to RCA mm -hmm. in uh, out in New Jersey. So I decided I, I did not want to go to New Jersey. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, in the meantime, while I was working on this project, I had, I had to come to Lansing, Michigan, uh, because the packaging uh, engineering school at Michigan State University was assigned a task of designing the containers and the packaging for us to ship the satellites from uh, upon completion to the to the respective launch sites. So they so I had to come to Lansing in um, in nineteen six in uh, I think it was October of sixty four sixty three. Sorry. Now this is something a lot of people don't talk, think about either. Is you hear about people going to school for packaging engineering, and I think sometimes people chuckle like that sounds like underwater basket weaving. No, but the program at Michigan State is no, it is it around is, the world. It's first class. It is first rate. They didn't make the packaging; they designed it, and then right. we had it made someplace else. But right. uh, <clears throat> the so I was I had to I had to come up to Lansing on on a near the end of a week, I don't remember, in that period, time period, mm -hmm. uh, to approve the design uh, for the packaging. Because we would build, the, have the packaging done and, in, and, in, and have the, have what, what NASA would do was they would send an, a, a special chartered aircraft to the airport in Indianapolis under guard, and we would take it to the airport, and they would, they would put it on the plane and ship it to the launch site, to, like to Vandenberg or to, to, J, or to Kennedy. Cape, Can Cape Canaveral. Sorry. Right. Well, <clears throat> going back to my military days, while I was on maneuvers in California, one at one one weekend, I visited a a family that my through some mutual friends in Indianapolis lived in Cucamonga, California. Uh huh. Uh, Doctor Kelly Anton, Achilles Anton, Greek boy, and his wife Betty. <clears throat> and while I was there, there was another Greek boy there. A boy of Greek uh, family, George Pappas, who was from Lansing, Michigan. He was an, a patent attorney, and he had flown at the end of World War II. He was a, a major or lieutenant colonel at that time, and he was on reserve duty out in California. So I met George, and we spent the weekend together. Uh -huh. This is back in before I got out of the service. Right. So he said he mentioned to me. He said, "If you ever come to Lansing, call me." And who would ever thought you'd be in Lansing, Michigan? Yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> so I'm up for this packaging thing, and it struck me that I ought to give him a call, mm -hmm. and I did. And it turned out to be the weekend of the Notre Dame-Michigan State football game. And he says, we got, I've got tickets. He said, would you like to go? I said, sure. So he said, would you like a date? I said, absolutely, that would be fine. 
<laughs> so, so who was your date, George? <laughs> Georgia Baziotis. Uh huh. Who was a lovely, a beautiful girl from uh, Lansing who was uh, attending, going to Michigan State University, and or had gone to Michigan State University rather. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, I met my future wife because of the packaging engineering group. <laughs> So I started. <laughs> wow! I was uh, so, and we were. I was still working on the satellite program. Was still going on. Right. So I was every two weeks on a weekend. I would drive up from Indianapolis to see her. Uh-huh. Uh huh. From that period of October <clears throat> of '63, we got. I gave her my fraternity pin in December of '63. I gave her an engagement ring in January of '64, and we got married in July of '64. In Lansing. Well, that was a pretty quick Well, I had to get married. I just got tired of the drive. <laughs> the highway, there was no... Interstate 69 did not exist then. Right. So it was, the, the highway was terrible. It was, it was, it was bad news. Oh, I can, I can only imagine. Uh, so. It sounds like maybe the Bagiotis family uh, took to you as well. Well, it, uh, it worked out as, uh, very very nicely, as you, as you know. And uh-huh. <clears throat> so... Um, um, <clears throat> that was it. And it, so a couple of years later, so I was, you know, the satellite program was going on for another two years, I think roughly two years. When the, when the program ended, uh, near that time, um, I was recruited to an Indianapolis company called the PR Mallory Corporation. And Mallory was a diversified manufacturer, Duracell batteries, mm-hmm. appliance controls, capacitors, uh, metallurgical products. I think that was it, and uh, they were right. Made in, Mallory batteries too. Yes, yeah, well, when Mallory, I was a kid, yeah, we used to Mallory batteries. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mallory batteries, and the Duracell was the trademark of of, yeah. of some of the batteries, the alkaline yeah. batteries. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> so I was recruited to Mallory, uh, and worked uh, for uh, one of the group vice president, vice president Leon Lin, who was a retired Air Force general. And he put me through some a kind of a management training program, training program there, and I was then assigned to the Timers Company that we made appliance controls. We were mm-hmm. the largest manufacturer uh, of appliance controls, uh, probably in the world. <clears throat> and uh, I, I did various engineering things with them for five or six months, getting acquainted. Uh, and then they, in June of '67, I think June, yeah. They they said we want you to tra- we want you to go to Warsaw, New York, to run the factory in Warsaw, New York. We had a big timers plant there that made we made close to ten thousand timers um, um, a week there. Washing machine timers, principally right, for a... Whirlpool, GE, uh, Maytag, uh, Hot Point, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you name it. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, it was a factory of about 500 women and 100 men, and we had a, a major parts fabrication department, punch presses, screw machines, uh, plate electroplating, uh, molding machines, plastic molding, uh, thermoplastic uh, molding, and then uh, uh, whatever. Um, and then we had these assembly lines with the women who would assemble these timers, and um uh, uh, We'd ship them every day. Yeah. So, I was that was my first uh, kind of manufacturing uh, experience. Uh, I was the manager for two years. Uh, at the end of exactly two years, my boss called me, and uh, Bob Quackenbush was his name. He was the president of the Timers Company. Uh, he said, "I want you to come back to be a works manager. A works manager in Mallory parlance was." was the guy responsible for fa- all the factories, all the manufacturing. So uh, Timers had uh, four factories, uh, Warsaw, Mount Morris, New York, Payne, Illinois, uh, Camden, Tennessee, and then we were going to build a new one in, in Sparta, Tennessee. So I, all those factories were uh, my, part of my responsibility, or what were my responsibility. And their plant managers would report to me, and I in turn reported to Quackenbush, the, the president. So I had that job for a couple of years, uh, I think a couple of years, and then they asked me to be the head of sales and marketing. So it was a total switch, so I became head of sales and marketing. Well, that's interesting for uh, an engineer to be the head of sales and marketing. 
Is that, I mean, yeah. you just don't, I, I guess you don't think about that uh, from going from engineering yeah. to, to that. Well, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, it, it seemed, I, I enjoyed it. I, I loved yeah. it. It was, it was, uh, that was not the only time that that happened to me, by well, the way. Well, it's because you're an engineer with a personality. <laughs> well, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't have a is. pocket protector. So. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Um, or as my daughter would say, you weren't a geek. Uh, um, so uh, a few years down the pike, I don't remember exactly, you know, I'm confused. The dates kind of oh, escape yeah. me now. But uh, I was recruited by a headhunting firm uh, by for uh, Controls Company of America, which was located in Schiller Park, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Uh, CCA Controls Company was uh, also in the control timer business, but they were also in a whole lot of other controls businesses, which we were not. They were in uh, air conditioning, refrigeration, heating. They made valves for air conditioners for all of the air conditioning systems for automobiles. They made most of those valves. Um, they had factories in, in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, in uh, North Manchester, Indiana, Winnemac, Indiana, Fremont, Ohio, uh, and then a very large, uh, a, a joint venture in Japan, Controls Company Japan, oh. <clears throat> in, Nago in Nagoya. And, and then in Europe, Controls Machupe Europa, which is CME, was the European business. And they had the headquarters in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. We had a factory in Munich, Germany. We had a factory in Schirmeck, France. Uh, Madrid, Spain, Alcobenda, Spain. Uh, uh, so, no, was part of your job to go visit all of these well, places too? Yeah, but at, at the beginning, uh, I was hired as vice president of marketing, so right. I was kind of marketing coordinator for all of the everything in the company. Okay. Each each division had their own mar sales and marketing group, mm -hmm. and I was kind of because I reported to the president of CCA, <clears throat> I, I was kind of supposed to kind of keep it together, if you will. Yeah. And learn the business. Uh, so I did, and I traveled extensively uh, in that role. I was overseas a lot. I was all over the place, mm -hmm. uh, Japan and what have you. Um, then they, they uh, I was promoted to a vice, a vice president, general manager of the appliance and automotive division, uh, which made all the appliance controls and uh, automotive electrics. Mm -hmm. uh, we made like windowless switches, um, um, tailgate switches. Uh, all of these things that when you drive your car, you don't really think about. That's right. But if you didn't have them, You'd think about it. Yeah. Yeah. We made a lot of, you know, ignitions, ignition switches. Uh -huh. um, uh, I've lost track of the, the catalog now. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. we, we had, you know, we, we were active with all of the, all of the big three automotives and uh, some overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, in Japan, we were a, 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 a vendor to a Toyota through Nippon Denso, which was the, the kind of the Delco Remy of, of Toyota. Um, and um, so I was vice president general manager of the, of that of the appliance automotive division for a couple of years, I think. And then the president, Don Strathern retired and I was stunned because they made me president. <laughs> I, I, I was, I was just kind of flabbergasted because there were, there were guys that were, had been there much longer than me and uh -huh. were older and more mature and more experienced. But I don't know why, but they, they appointed me president. Uh, CCA was a, was a public company. Uh, but we, as shortly after uh, I became president, we were uh, stuck with a, a hostile takeover by the Singer company, Singer sewing machine yeah. who had all kinds of cash, so all of a sudden, we weren't Controls Company of America anymore. We were the Controls Division of the Singer Company. Well, that's and, interesting. <laughs> and and so I, in, in, rather than being a president and CEO of CGA, I was now a division president of the Controls Division. Uh, the Singer Company had a great reputation for many years in, in lots of ways, but uh, they knew nothing about any of these other businesses, and they were buying businesses all over the place. They bought air conditioning business. 
They bought uh, power tool. They made all the power tools for 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 uh, Sears. Oh, um, uh, the drills and and, and the stuff. Uh, you don't think about that when you think about no. Singer. You think well, about sewing machines, and yeah, that's it. Well, they they had a, a Frieden calculator. They had a Frieden computer uh-huh. business. Uh, they had a lot of businesses, and and all of them, all of them were a disaster after they took them over because they were just, you know, they they just they were sewing machine guys. They didn't right. know, they didn't squat about any of this stuff. So, <clears throat> but so they thought they're throwing money at all these things was was going to make it happen, and so. <laughs> Um, uh, I was not too pleased. I was president for a, a couple of years, but I was not happy with it at all. And uh, I was then recruited uh, because I was getting calls from headhunters all the time anyway. Mm-hmm. As, uh, and uh, <clears throat> ITW, Illinois Tool Works in Chicago, uh, sought me out, and John Nichols, the CEO, and wanted me to come over to be the president of the electronics group at ITW, and it was right in town, so I didn't have to move, yeah. which, which was great. <clears throat> and uh, so I went to work for ITW as president, uh, executive vice president of the corporation and president of the electronics group. And we made keyboards and switches, uh, you know, uh, elect- toggle switches, push button switches, all kinds of switch arrays and stuff, capacitors, uh, thick film networks. Uh, all kinds of things like that. At, at ITW is absolutely a sensational company. It was just uh, unbelievably well run, uh, totally diversified uh, in all these things, and yet it, it, it just it, there was a culture there that was just impossible to to replicate, and it was just marvelous. It, I, I was so happy there, and. Uh, um, <clears throat> That went on for a good while, and uh, but we got trapped in the in the in in, a, in the major technology shift because as the new computers uh, and the and the, and the uh, <coughs> um, as the as the Orientals, particularly the Japanese, began uh, to really make strong headroads uh, into into the electronic components business. Mm-hmm. You know, making capacitors and and resistors and all kinds of things, they just were they were decimating U.S. manufacturers. Right. And and I remember vividly, uh, Motorola was a big customer of our capacitor business because we made capacitors in Virginia, we made them in in Taiwan, um, and uh, Motorola was a big customer. And they said, "You're done. We're not going to buy from you anymore because we're going to buy from Toshiba in Japan now." And that was purely a business decision, right? I mean, yeah, it was, it was, she, it was cheaper to do that. And uh, and they said they're 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 spending they're investing a lot more money in in advanced technologies, and you guys are not. And and they were right. Yeah. Uh, and on and on and on. So you know, all of a sudden, our business started to go to pot um, uh, big time. And our the same thing with our keyboard business because we made uh, we were the one of the we were the leading manufacturer of keyboards. Mm-hmm. In the United States, <clears throat> uh, and and they were elegant. I mean, all the keys were two shot molded, so that the, the yeah, they never wore out. So you know, you, right. and, and so, uh, but they're, that's expensive. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, where we were selling keyboards to the airlines, so that their clerks and and, and people and these these dis- where they had distributed processing, where you have a room full of ladies oh, just yeah. entering data. Well, now everybody had a keyboard. And that had, had to be cheap, really cheap. Right. They didn't care if it wore out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it was just cheap to buy. In fact, we made the prototype keyboards for Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, mm-hmm. who I met that one one time. We made the prototype for their first Apple, the full, first Macintosh computer. Oh my gosh! And but when it came time to for production order, they said you guys are way too expensive, so they went someplace else. They went overseas. Yeah. So our keyboard business really really took a hit. Our capacitor business took a hit. The switch business took sort of a hit. But we were, it was, so I just, I thought my job is in trouble here. <laughs> Might be time to look for something so else. So <laughs> I, I was asked to, to join <clears throat> um, um, 
Singer, or uh, Siemens, excuse me. Mm -hmm. And my neighbor, my next door neighbor in Chicago, in Inverness, where we lived, uh, was was an executive with uh, Gould, the Gould company. And uh, Siemens was buying up various businesses in, in the electrical field, and they bought uh, ITE uh, circuit breaker business uh, and switch business from Gould. And Harry Berker, who was the guy who, the Gould executive running this, became the president of this new company called Siemens Energy and Automation to be based in, in Atlanta, Alpharetta, Georgia. Okay. Harry was my neighbor, and Harry said, you know, you've run a lot of factories and all that. He said, I need a guy to be my vice, executive vice president of operations, of factories, of manufacturing. Because <clears throat> Siemens bought ITE from Gould. They bought all the Siemens, Chal Alice, I'm sorry, Alice Chalmers businesses, which uh -huh. were numerous and, and really screwed up <laughs> businesses <laughs> over the door. And so we had this whole conglomerate of, of, of businesses uh, all over the country. <clears throat> uh, and he asked me to move to Atlanta and run and clean them up, basically. Right. Uh, which I did. And um, I did that for uh, three or four years. I was on the board of Siemens Energy and Automation, what they call the Vorstein, the German Vorstein. Um, and then uh, one day the chairman of Siemens and asked, asked me at a board meeting, he said, we want you to uh, put together all, all these businesses that had been purchased had their own organizations, right. administration, sales, marketing. He says, we, want, we, we at Siemens believe in having a, a Siemens office where everything is cohesive. And we want you to do that in the States. I thought, ooh. <laughs> so... I so they up, were they were looking to be more centrally yes, central, yes, centralized command. Central control was yeah. was the name of the game in Siemens, big time. Yeah. Uh, so I inherited a whole bunch of disparate sales offices, sales organizations, salesmen, company cars, uh, the the uh, uh, incentive plans, pay plans. A salary scale. It was. I mean, they were all over the place. Yeah, they all had their own, right? Oh yeah. It oh was, boy. It was. It was. It was fun. It was actually. <laughs> actually, I really enjoyed this job. Uh huh. Uh, <clears throat> so it it took a while to get it squared away, but it, it took a year or two, but we got it done. And um, so um, I did that for a while, and. Um, <clears throat> So before we get before we yeah. leave Georgia, though, mm -hmm. um, I know that you had mentioned your daughter. Uh, so are, are there children coming along the way? Oh yes. Um, as we're going through oh, all oh, of this, oh absolutely yes. I I, uh, I neglected to mention them. <laughs> They're important in my life. <laughs> uh, Georgia and I had three children. Mm -hmm. um, Tom was uh, uh, was was born in um, sixty. Uh, six. Uh, Nick was born in '67. Uh, Libby was born in '70. Um, they all ended up. They all went to uh, high school. Uh, well, they went to school in high school in in Chicago in the suburbs in um, Palatine. Uh huh. Uh, but then when we moved to Atlanta, the boys were already in college at Wake Forest University. But Libby went, still had three years of high school. So she went to high school at the Marist School in, in, in Atlanta, an excellent, it was a Catholic school, very good school. <clears throat> and then upon graduation, she too went to Wake Forest University. So all three of your children All went three to went to Wake. All three got their bachelor's degree at Wake. Uh -huh. Tom went on to go to medical school at Georgia, and then he came back and did his residency at the Wake Forest uh, Bowman Gray School of Medicine. Nick... Uh, finished his four years and then went to law school at Wake Forest. So he got his JD, uh, his Juris Doctor at Wake Forest. Libby did just four years, but at at uh, Wake Forest she got her her degree in French and uh, language and and uh, French uh, literature. Um. So you know, Tom went on to establish a, 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 a he became an obstetrician and gynecologist in Winston Salem, where he. 
to, to this day practices, has a very thriving uh, practice there in Winston-Salem, and is married, has uh, uh, two children. Uh, Nick is a senior uh, attorney, uh, uh, senior partner and uh, equity partner at a, law, a big law firm in, Sh- in North Carolina, mm-hmm. out of Charlotte and, Ra- and uh, Raleigh, uh, has two children, uh, very successful. They are two as well, our grandchildren. Uh, Libby uh, f- finished awake and then went to work for Delta Airlines as a, a linguist and flew to France for nine years and has had the time of her life. I was going to say, that doesn't sound too rough. No, it was great. It was wonderful. <laughs> Dude, I was, I was distressed because I kept asking her, what is she going to do when she graduates? And she said, well, I, I'm not going to work in an office and I'm not going to teach. I thought, well, that cuts it down pretty good. So, right. But she ended up with a great job. <clears throat> anyway, uh, so that's where, the, I mean, unless you want me to elaborate further about the well, kids. I, I want to ask you, um, yeah, I think we could probably spend hours talking about the kids, yeah, right? Yeah, true. Um, but I would, I would like to go, like, with each one of the, the, the children and just ask you, you know, like, for instance, I asked you this earlier about your parents. So when you think about Tom, um, you know, what really is, the, like, the first thing that comes to your mind about him? And we'll, we'll talk about each one of the, the kids that way. And just maybe, like, a favorite memory or just something that, that, you know, touches you when you think about them. Well, Tom is a very... A thorough, uh, very intense, um, uh, a very compassionate person, um, and uh, you know, a, a, an excellent doctor, mm-hmm. and and a, and, a, and a dedicated dad. Uh, Nick is more laid back, but is and is very religious uh, as well. Um, and and is is extremely thoughtful, and uh, and just uh, unassuming, but but very effective uh, in his legal work. Obviously, because he's been he's done extremely well in that. Uh, Libby, uh, who is probably the smartest of the three, uh, is a very is very intense and organized, and uh, um, uh, the boss. She's. She's she's right there, uh-huh. and um, uh, the three get along very very well. They communicate constantly, so we're thrilled with that. Uh, that's that's been a, a very heartwarming uh, result of, of the relationship. And uh, the boys live in North Carolina, one in Winston Salem, one in Charlotte, and then Libby lives in East Lansing, Michigan, uh, very close to where we are now. Mm-hmm. So. Um, uh, and they they've raised the, their families uh, each have two children and uh, all very successful and uh very happy and and uh dedicated uh, their families are 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 model families in my view well, i think you set the bar pretty high for successful families well i don't know but um but yeah uh knowing them all my, myself yeah. i uh, yeah. i, I couldn't agree more. I do want to ask you, so we're going to go back to Alfreda, Georgia, but I, I got one more question for you. Yeah. And um, so I think about you uh, and, you know, your dad, uh, your parents running a flower shop, living in Indiana. Um, and then I see uh, your kids all, at, at the very least, got a bachelor's degree and, 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 and beyond for, for some of them. Um, how important was education to your parents and, and how important is education to you? Well, <clears throat> it was uh, extremely important to my parents. I mean, the typical immigrant uh, uh, goal and, and a vision and, and dream was to have children who could, you know, go to college. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> the idea of not, do it, not going to college was that just wasn't going to fly. And then once you got to college, you better do well. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. so that was, you know, the, the, there was a high bar there. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as Georgia and I were concerned with our kids, we uh, we obviously wanted them to to do. We wanted them to be happy. We wanted them to be uh, uh, fulfilled in, in whatever they planned to do, and to, to have uh, definitive and achievable goals, which all of them did really. Mm-hmm. And even as I said, you know, the boys were more into the, the student, into the academics. 
uh, Libby was more into the social and 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 but but then again she was very successful in what she did and uh, she's like I say the smartest one of the three and she just she knew what she was going to do and she did it and uh, and the boys as well the same mm-hmm. thing so um, you know we we never forced those things on them but but they knew that that was Part of the plan. It was an expectation. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, you know, I think as a parent, uh, like with my children, I always want that next generation to do a little bit better than I did. And um, so I think if you look back at your parents and they can see how, how things have progressed, yeah. um, I think that's what's happening, yeah. right? Each generation's doing uh, a little bit better than yeah. the, than the yeah. previous. Well, I think that's true. It's yeah. certainly true in our case. Yeah. So... Um, <clears throat> so let's go back to Alpharetta, Georgia. Okay. You cleaned up this mess at Siemens because they had all these different yeah. uh, groups that yeah. all probably yeah. thought they were their own individual yeah. companies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you got that cleaned up. So what what happens after that? Okay. Well, the um, um, there was a a. Uh, I was recruited uh, from Siemens <clears throat> to be the president and CEO of a company called the Genlite Group. Mm-hmm. Genlite was a the largest uh, manufacturer of, of lighting products in the United States at that time. Uh, they had a whole bunch of different brand names, uh, Light Lear being the premium light name. Um, and light, Gen Light was 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 a, 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 a combination of a bunch of individually owned lighting businesses, mostly uh, 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 started and developed by Jewish entrepreneurs who were not only great designers but but very sharp businessmen. Mm-hmm. And this company was a big company. It was headquartered in Secaucus, New Jersey. And uh, it, it was the premier lighting business. And it had, I mean, we had the top of the line was Light Alire, and then we made uh, lighting cans, and we had all kinds of, uh, we had a couple of fluorescent plants. We had a big facility in Canada. Uh, did a lot of business in China. Had c- contractors over there and in Mexico, in Maquiladores. Um and uh, I was hired as the to be the president and CEO, and I was very excited about it. It was it looked like a lot of fun to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, what I didn't expect <clears throat> was the fact that these these entrepreneurs who were still share major shareholders because this was a listed company on the New York, on the stock exchange. Yeah, they were all major shareholders, and they all had their own peculiar. Uh, ideas about things, uh, one of which was uh, to have a lot of family members on the payroll, even though they didn't work there, but oh. they were drawing money. Oh, that could uh, be a problem. Uh, yes. So as after some months, I wasn't there more than maybe six or seven months, and I started to uh, begin to, uh, you know, took a while to kind of see what's going on, but we had we had all this this going on, these people going on, working that were not there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's called constructive receipt, and that's against the law. Right. And it's a public company. So uh, every quarter I had to sign a a, a 1099 uh, for the SEC vouching for the the numbers, you know. Yeah. And um, we also had a big problem because they had invested all of the pension funds the defined benefit pension funds in Israeli bonds. Hmm. And they were also uh, the uh, head of the um, Canadian company, Avi Drazen, who's a really nice guy, a very sharp guy. And we had a big business in Canada. Uh, every year he would submit an expense account for like twenty five to $30,000 with no receipts or anything, just expense account. <laughs> Oh, and he, what he was doing was he was donating it to various Israeli uh, things right. in Canada. Well, 
th those things don't work in a public company. I mean, you just can't do that. Right, you have to be above board. And uh, we had a falling out at the board. I was on the board, and uh, not the chairman. I was on, but I was on the board. Um, and I decided. I said, I, I cannot sign the ten. I can't sign the ten Qs, ten ninety nines. And so we mutually agreed that I would I would uh, execute by severance agreement. So I ended up with a big bunch of money, and I went. I I never had moved. I didn't never moved to New Jersey from from Atlanta. So I so I went back to Atlanta. Uh, I was immediately called by a company called Dylan Reed. Dylan Reed was a very old, very prestigious. Uh, white shoe investment banking firm out in New York City. <clears throat> and they said, we want to talk to you. So I went, I went back up to New York and talked to them. And they said, we're looking for guys like you to work with a, our team of analysts and accountants, financial people in our company, because we have a lot of money from investors and they want to invest in companies. But we got to go out and buy these companies and we got to find them. Right. So... Uh, we want you to be the lead dog in what the deal is. Uh, we buy the company, you become the president and CEO, and you get you get ten percent of the company off the bat. So I thought, whoop, that right. that's pretty good. That could be great, or it could be bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the problem is, is that there are there's way too much money chasing too few companies. Yeah. So we looked at maybe six companies over a period of a year and a half. Traveled all over the place looking at these and evaluating and meeting. And it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was very interesting. It was like getting an MBA. It was really, you know, like a an MBA on with airline tickets. You know, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we can. We never were able to successfully uh, buy or close on a new business. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> in the meantime, I was approached again by a headhunter to uh, to come to Temple Steel Company. Uh, they needed a president and CEO. So uh, I was recruited to become the president and CEO of Temple Steel Company, which was the largest manufacturer of electrical steel laminations in the world. Uh, la electrical steel laminations are used in electric motors and transformers. Uh, and um, uh, Temple was located... Uh, it was a family-owned company. Um, the descendants of Temple Smith um, uh, owned the company. Um, facilities were in in uh, Chicago, on Bryn Mawr Avenue, and in Libertyville, uh, Illinois. And uh, and also there was a t we had a tool company in uh, out in um, Elk Grove Village, <clears throat> Illinois. They made the tool stamping dies for us. Mm -hmm. um, so I was uh, uh, 56 years old uh, at the time because I worked for them for 10 years. I retired from them in six, when I was 66. So uh, I really enjoyed it. It was a great business. The interesting thing was I didn't know anything about steel, and I didn't know anything about you know that kind of thing. But what I did know a lot about <clears throat> was the electrical business, electronics business, and our customers were the electrical and electronics business. And so I knew a lot about the markets and the the applications, and we had plenty of people in the company who were metallurgists and who knew a lot about steel and making steel, although over time I did learn a lot about steel. Mm -hmm. Um and we had a very uh, it was it was a lot of fun it was a, it was a very good experience we moved to chicago we moved to downtown chicago and bought a condominium on 1555 north astor street downtown at, at the corner of north avenue and astor at lincoln park on the 32nd floor and we loved it it was really great and it was great for my wife because she was able to shop at all the best stores all over. And <laughs> that is very important. And spend a lot of money, yes. Uh, <clears throat> but it was good for her. It was very therapeutic for her. So um, anyway, uh, we uh, we built, I built, was able to uh, build, a, uh, help build the business uh, pretty significantly to the, the point where 
when it started, it was about a half a billion dollars in business, and it was I took it over to over a billion in the ten year period. Uh, very substantial profits. The family made a lot of money. Uh, I made a lot of money. Fortunately, is part of that. <clears throat> um, we built a big factory in Monterey, Mexico, um, to take advantage of of the fact that most of our customers, uh, many of our customers, moved to Mexico. And uh, people were at the beginning were very critical. They said, "You're moving. You're you're going to start shipping stuff back." And I said, uh, right. "No, no." We no parts that we stamp in Mexico will come back to the United States from us. We're only stamping for our for customers that are located in Mexico. We ship from our Mexican plant to other Mexican plants. Now, if the, if that customer is going to make something and ship it back to the states, I can't help that. That's not my problem. Right. So, but but I I you know I have to we have to protect our market position. And so uh, we did that, and we have we built a, a beautiful, big factory in Monterey to supply all the appliance and automotive people and electric motor people that were all down there because Emerson and GE and all these other guys were all uh, had all moved many you know a lot of their facility not all totally but a lot of their facilities to Mexico. So we ended up having a very successful <coughs> Mexican uh, facility. And, uh, of course, the market changed over time. When I first started, uh, uh, black and white TVs uh, were still, uh, and color were just beginning to come. Mm -hmm. And, of course, solid-state TVs were were just on the horizon, so there were still a lot of, you remember TV sets where you could hardly pick them up. They were so heavy because they had these big transformers in them. Oh, yeah. Well, guess who made all the laminations for those transformers? We did. <laughs> well, all of a sudden, that business was, boop, it evaporated. Right. Mic microchips didn't help you. Oh, out. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, that was, you know, technology was wonderful, but it was also, it could be brutal. And, right. And, uh, and you never knew when it was going to hit you. <clears throat> So, uh, was you know was was running the company was on the board of the company and they did they they treated me very very well you know I had no 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 real complaints so I retired from the company uh, when I was uh, sixty six years old and uh, remained on the board of directors uh, for another uh, five, five years four or five years I guess. Um, and I was on the board of a couple of other outside business companies as well until I was about 70. And then I decided it was I threw traveling. I didn't want to do that anymore. And mm -hmm. so I, I stopped uh, all of those things. I did have a couple of side things, like when I was living in, uh, in North Carolina when I was retired, <clears throat> I did uh, lecturing and, and mentoring at the business school at Wake Forest University, which was very rewarding and a lot of fun, um, sharing experiences with the young students. And, yeah. um, um, well, let's talk about mentoring for just a minute, right? Because I think anyone who's successful, um, you know, a certain amount of your success has to do with you, but I think some of the success that we have has to do with the people around us too. So, you know, can you think of maybe one or two people who were mentors to you well, um, yeah. as you were coming up? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My greatest, the most important mentor that I had was at Elroy Toolworks. His name was John D. Nichols. John was the CEO, had just come aboard ITW as the CEO. <clears throat> he was a Harvard graduate, a Harvard Business School graduate. He was a captain of the Harvard football team. Uh, he'd been in the Army as well. Uh, and and was just uh, so smart and so laid back, and um, he just he was just a marvelous guy to work for and with. Mm -hmm. uh, John was my fa my very very favorite uh, mentor over time. Um, uh, Frank Oglesby at at NAFI at the Naval Avionics Facility was a senior guy there, and he was also a mentor in my very early days of business and uh, was e extremely helpful in, in, coaching, in coaching me to be, um, 
I guess I hate to use the term a successful manager or a mm-hmm. compassionate, understanding manager, I, I probably should say. And uh, uh, let's see. Well, in the Army, uh, our Captain Harry Z. Kaklikian, who was our company commander, uh, uh, was was a, was a very interesting mentor, and uh, as was our first sergeant, Sergeant Joe Soul, who was who, who who taught who taught me how to handle young eighteen boy eighteen year old boys who were who who were falling in love with all the young girls in the cantinas <laughs> in Mexico. So <laughs> that could be a problem. That could oh, be yeah. a problem. It was a problem, sure. by the way. But uh, <clears throat> so I've just. You know, there have been a lot of people that have have helped have helped me a lot over the years, uh-huh. and um, uh, a lot of people actually, uh, almost too many to to count. Well, so you're uh, you're completely retired now. Oh yes. Um, you, you know, we're here in East Lansing, Michigan. You have a, um, you've been married for a couple of years, fifty right? uh, nine years. Right. So your sixtieth wedding anniversary is next next again. July. Yeah, on the, on the horizon. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, Georgia, your wife, and um, you know, just uh, what are some what are some of the things uh, that uh, that you were, that you think of when you think of her? Um, I know shopping is one of them. I heard well, that, yeah. but uh, well, I'm sure she, there's some other things too. She's uh, oh, first of all, she has an impeccable taste, in my opinion. She's a, a, a very very capable designer. Uh, interior design and 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 uh, fashion and and uh, uh, furnishings and that kind of thing. I mean, she's just got a great eye for that, and uh, <clears throat> and does a good job with it. Uh, she did a, a really really good job of of raising our three children uh, and, and keeping them on the straight and narrow, but giving them the freedom to do to to develop and grow as as they could. Uh, because I was gone a lot, I was traveling all over the place. I've got, I had millions of miles on airlines. I, you know, I'd put a lot of time in on at airports and in all of the jobs that I had talked about earlier uh, yeah. on this on this tape. Uh, so uh, I was not around a lot, and uh, I was uh, a I don't want to say an absent father, but I was not a full time dad either, because I just wasn't, you know, my job. Didn't allow it, or I didn't allow it. I guess I should. I shouldn't blame the job. Did, but did having her, knowing that she was the one that was home taking care of the kids, did that make it easier for you to do your job? Absolutely. It was. Uh, I mean, it was. I was very confident that things were under control at home, and that, that there was no that I. And, you know, we we communicated constantly about everything, but I was never never concerned uh, about. <clears throat> um, the house, the household, never. And yeah. um, it just never, never was. Mm-hmm. What do you think the secret is to sixty years of marriage? <laughs> <laughs> patience <laughs> on both sides of that, right? Patience, patience, yes, yes patience, both sides yeah. of that. Tolerance, patience. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, a. <clears throat> it, it's it's. It requires a lot. I mean, it, it, it's it, it's not without work, right? And effort, right? I think people think it's easy, like getting get, getting married's easy. But oh, staying yeah. married, staying married—that's actual work. Yeah, that is, you're absolutely right. It is, uh, and, and uh, you know, they talk about the over time, but you know that you, you don't you don't develop at the same rate, and so and and your tastes don't develop at the same rate. So you, there's always this. This to and fro um, involved, so it's mm-hmm. it it requires uh, you know a lot of a lot of patience and um, but I uh, <clears throat> I'd mentioned my fraternity brothers that, that I'm very very close to mm-hmm. my pledge brothers and we still uh, to this day zoom once a month and um, those of us that are still alive and there are there are about ten or ten or twelve of us. Um, who show up on the Zoom? <clears throat> We're getting together, by the way, for our final face-to-face reunion at Purdue uh, this coming uh, September. 
but uh, all of us, I think uh, of all of the guys, the only, I think only one uh, was got a divorce and then he remarried and married a very nice young lady. Mm -hmm. Uh, Everybody else has been married a lot of years because I was in all of their way, almost all their weddings. So (laughs) so I know, (laughs) I know the well. They were in my wedding. I was in their wedding. So, uh, um, there was a lot of stability, I should say, in in that that group. So yeah, well, you have done a lot in your t- in your time on this planet. I mean, it's a it's 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 a very interesting life, and it sounds like very fulfilling. Um, but as we sort of wrap up our conversation today, I, I got, I've got one more question sure. for you. Um, you know, people are going to listen to this, um, and they're going to hear about your life. But, you know, 50 years from now, when probably neither one of us is here, unless modern medicine figures something out, um, you know, what what would you like people to take away from our conversation? What what piece of advice would you give to people uh, in the future? Well, I think I think the. The things that that have two things. I think the thing that has helped me the most has been uh, patience and developing uh, positive relationships with with people. the The thing that has probably hurt me the most was uh, a failure to recognize uh, rapid changes in technology. Until it was too late. <laughs> so, so uh, the, I guess those are the two, two, two pretty critical things. Uh-huh. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. What else can I say? I don't know. Well, that's it. That's it. I mean, that's the, I asked the question, and that that's a, it's a great answer. So, thanks for taking the time out today um, to talk with me, and uh, um, looking forward to further conversation. Yes, sir. Thank you for listening to another episode of Veterans Archives, the podcast that brings you the story of the men and women who have created and lived our military history. If you or someone you know served in the military and would like to share your story with Veterans Archives, please go to www.veteransarchives.org, select the Apply Now button, and fill out our application, and someone will get right back with you. Veterans Archives is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we rely on the donations of our listeners. If you are enjoying these stories and you support our efforts, please go to www.veteransarchives.org and select the Donate button. Any donation is certainly appreciated. Look for Veterans Archives on your favorite social media. We are on LinkedIn. Instagram, and Facebook. Just look for Veterans Archives. Like, follow, and share our page. We'd certainly appreciate it. If you or someone you know is a veteran and you are struggling with mental health issues, please dial 988 and select option one for the Veterans Crisis Hotline. Please be sure to tune in next time for the next episode of Veterans Archives.